Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I am Mohammed Ismail. I'm from Tennessee Tech University. Uh, and today I'll, I'll give uh, some sort of a workshop, or you can call it a tutorial, about our work related to deep machine learning techniques to develop intrusion detection systems for cyber physical critical infrastructures. So this work is supported by our NSF award. This is from the EPCN program. The project title is Shield. And this targets developing deep machine learning techniques <coughs> power system, like to defend the power system. And this project is in collaboration between Tennessee Tech University and Texas A&M University. Uh, the material developed here are supported by the project, and this trip as well is supported by the project. So first, I'll, I'll give a, a brief biographical sketch about myself. So I got my uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering with a focus on electronics and communications, and my master also. So both of them are from Ain Shams University. That's in Cairo, Egypt, in 2007 and 2009. And then I did my PhD in electrical and computer engineering from University of Waterloo, that's in Canada, in 2013. And then from 2013 till 2019, I worked as a research scientist and visiting lecturer at Texas and m University. They have a branch campus in Qatar, and this is where I used to work. And as you can see, I have lived, I have been educated, and I worked in Africa, North America, and Asia. So that's half of the world, and looking forward to explore the other half. So since 2019, I joined Tennessee Tech University as an assistant professor, and now I am an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. Our research work, uh, me and my team, we look into applications of machine learning in cyber physical security. We, always look, we also look at applications of machine learning in 5G and beyond wireless networks. So, so this is a photo of my uh, research team that we took it in January. This was during a visit uh, from the team here. This is a team where we have a joint project between us and Japan. And this was taken during the visit from the team in Japan. So basically everyone at the back is, is my students. These are uh, roughly 12 PhD students, eight master students, and six undergrads. And as I said, we, we look into problems related to applications of machine learning in cyber physical security, 5G and beyond networks. And recently, uh, like two or three years ago, we started to do some work related to application of quantum information science in security and networking. So our funds or our research is supported by funds from the NSF and from Qatar Foundation. And also I'm the PI of the scholarship for service program at Tennessee Tech. So this is where we uh, attract uh, U.S. citizens and permanent residents, so they can do bachelor, master, and PhD in cyber security. Currently, the program has 18 enrolled students, and we are projected to recruit more, like 20 more students until 2026. So we have a set of test beds uh, at our lab. Uh, these are many of them <coughs> critical infrastructures, like, for example, power system infrastructure, we have some tools also to do smart manufacturing test bed, and we have some tools also for unmanned aerial vehicles. So this is the, the outline of my talk today. Uh, what I would like to cover with wow. you, so as it was uh, described in the abstract of this uh, workshop, I assume that the audience does not have background in cyber physical system and also does not have background necessarily <coughs> in learning. So what we will cover would be first, a brief introduction on what are the cyber physical systems. And then we will describe the power system as a cyber physical infrastructure. And we will look at a test bed that we developed at Tennessee Tech University to describe this power system as a cyber physical uh, infrastructure. After these uh, two points, then we will focus into how we can develop deep, deep machine learning techniques for intrusion detection for this system. So basically, I'll give again, because I don't assume you have background in machine learning, we will talk about a brief introduction to machine learning. Then we will look into what are deep supervised and unsupervised models. Uh, I don't think we will be able to cover all the items covered here, but at least we will cover the deep feed forward and the deep autoencoder models. Uh, I'll share with you the uh, Google Collab uh, notebook 
which describe how to do the training and developing of these models. And we'll walk through the code and see how you can do that. Uh, and then we will conclude our talk uh, with how we can develop uh, deep models uh, with cyber physical fusion. So your intrusion detector now will not only use features collected from the cyber domain, but also features collected from the physical domain, which is the power system. And I'll show you that when you fuse features from both domains, you can improve your intrusion detection, let's say here in the results by 5%. Any questions so far? So we start with the cyber physical system. So this is the definition of the cyber physical system according to the NSF. So you can see that the cyber physical system, it integrate two parts, right? So the cyber domain will introduce these functionalities, sensing, computation, control, and networking. And these will be introduced into the physical domain or the physical object and infrastructure. Why would we connect them? So, so we ca they can be connected to the internet and they can be connected to each other. And this is supposed to help us to be uh, more responsive if there is any emergency in the critical infrastructure, for example, then we can take action because we are connected, right? We can be more efficient into managing this critical infrastructure because now we have lots of information, lots of data that we can use to uh, improve how we uh, use our assets. Uh, and this will make our systems more efficient, okay? So this is the definition. And as you can see, based on this definition, these are the components that you would see in the cyber part of the cyber physical system. So the first thing is the, the, the sensing component. Uh, you would find that your physical domain now, in our case, for example, the power system, you will find lots of sensors deployed across this uh, physical infrastructure. And these sensors are supposed to collect information about the current status of the system. Again, talking about something like the power system, this could be, for example, what's the current voltage levels at different nodes? What's the current flow? What is the active and reactive power levels? Okay, so these are information that we collect from sensors. Again, in the context of power system, this could be, for example, a phase or measurement unit, okay? Then another component is the computation component. So now that you have collected all this information from the sensors, you use them in some program so you can infer what should be your next action. Again, if we are talking about a power system, this could be, for example, uh, to do power flow control. So how much voltage you need to inject. Uh, or for example, if you need to trip a switch on or off, right? So, so all this computation, when you collect this information from your physical system, then in your computation domain, you would come up or devise some optimal policies. Uh, Moving on, after you have found the, the computation and the right actions to be taken, then it comes the control part. And the control part where you have set of actuators. And these actuators are embedded in the physical system that will cause, for example, a switch to open, okay, or, or will increase injection power at some nodes. So these are the control action being done with the actuator. And of course, you need a networking component so you can connect all these sensors to the computation domain, to the control domain, so you can eventually uh, take actions, okay? So these are the, the components that you would see, and we infuse and integrate them with the physical domain. So this is the part in our title when we say cyber physical. So that's what a cyber physical uh, look like. You would expect to see some sensors and then some computations and then some uh, actuators to take control actions. And then finally, uh, all these are connected through uh, the network. Yep, absolutely. Very good. So now we, we have defined this part in our title, which is cyber physical. The second part in our title was talking about a cyber physical critical infrastructure. So what is a critical infrastructure? So a critical infrastructure is a physical and cyber system or physical and cyber systems and assets that are vital for the United States, that their incapacity or destruction would uh, 
debilitate the impact on our physical or economic security or public health safety. Imagine, for example, if there is an attack on a power system, how this would affect the lives of people, let's say at hospitals, how this would affect the economy because of this, the old factories would stop. So, so that's, that's an example of a critical infrastructure. And there is a comprehensive list of the, compre of the critical infrastructure that has been provided by the US Department of Homeland Security in this link, which give you some sort of a comprehensive list. And these are some examples, like for example, the, the dams for flood control, uh, petrochemical, facilities, oil and gas distribution, factory automation, water distribution. So all these are examples of critical infrastructure. And here in all these, as we said before, you would find sensors infused inside these systems to collect the status, the current status of the system. You would find some computation algorithms that would take based on the current status, what should be the next action to take. And then you would find actuators in these systems that will take the control action and all these components are connected together with a network and our focus in in this talk will be on one critical infrastructure which is the power system or the electric power grid so this is how the electric power grid at the physical layer look like you you would have a bulk generation unit like here as you can see this one here is a bulk generation unit let me See if I can use a pointer. Yeah, so, so this one here is a, a bulk generation unit, or we can call it, uh, you can think of this as uh, a coal plant or, or uh, a nuclear uh, facility that, that generate the, the power. So this is the bulk generation. And then we uh, step up the voltage so we can send it to the, houses or factories, right? So we need to make here a step up transformer. And then all of these are the transmission uh, component of the power grid, where we carry the electricity from the generation unit all the way to the customers, okay? So we have bulk generation, and then we do step up voltage. Why we do step up voltage? Because we will carry this uh, electricity for long distances and we want to minimize our losses. And then we reach then the distribution substation this is a distribution substation that will bring down the voltage to a level that we can now distribute it to houses and, and factories and so on and so these are actually the loads that will use this power so this is our physical layer and as you can see you can actually describe this as a graph because these this is like one node we can call it a power node that is a generation unit and we have here also another node, which is the distribution substation. This can be seen as a load unit. So we have a generation unit and a load unit. And all of these are connected with some edges, or we can call them links, right? So these are transmission lines and distribution lines. Now, as I said before, inside this system, you would find lots of phasor measurement units, uh, sensors that will read uh, the current status of the system voltage levels, you can also read the, 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 the phasors, the phasor angle of this voltage because it's a complex value, uh, injected power, active and reactive power, uh, power loads, power flows, and all this information. Now, all of this information that we will collect are useful for situational awareness. So the, 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 the utility company, the, the electric utility company, uh, the operator would know what is the current status of the power grid. Is it overloaded? Is it underloaded? Do we need to inject more power? Are we serving loads efficiently and so on? And also we collect this information and we use them in some computations like power flow analysis, unit commitment, and so on. And also at the customer level, we can collect this information also for billing, right? Because these are the loads that, that will be consumed. So we can use also this uh, continuous monitoring for billing support. And so to one, one system that will include all the components that we just talked about, which are the uh, sensors connected to computers, connected to actuators with some networks, is the SCADA system. Okay, so the SCADA system, this consists of set of computers, network data communications, and graphical user interfaces that will monitor and control the industrial process. So SCADA is short for supervisory, control, and data acquisition. And so the, the supervisory component here, it will manage your system, it will oversee the system, it will administer the system. The control component would it change the current status of the system to another state 
Like for example, you can open or close circuit breakers. Uh, you can inject more power based on the demand and so on. And then the data acquisition component is where you uh, collect data from the system using the available sensors. And this is how roughly the SCADA architecture would look like. You have your physical system here. In our case, this is the power system. And then this is connected to something called PLC. We will talk more about it, programmable logic controller. And uh, the physical system and the programmable logic controller are connected with cyber physical link. And then the PLC also is connected to something called HMI, the human machine interface. So we will cover these components quickly one by one. So the first one is our physical system. This is the physical structure of your process. So if you are talking, for example, about oil and gas distribution, then your physical system are the, 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 the pipes and the valves and, and everything, right? In our case, it's the uh, generation units, the, the generation substation that, that we talked about, the uh, load unit, which are the uh, distribution substations, and the links connecting all these components together. This is in here, our physical system. And as we said before, inside this physical system, we have a bunch of sensors. Uh, these sensors will measure the quantities like voltage level, active and reactive powers, uh, current flows, and so on. And also inside this system, we have a bunch of actuators. And these actuators will control the operation of this system. As we said before, we can have some circuit breakers to connect or disconnect a generation unit to the grid or connect or disconnect a load from this grid. We can have also voltage regulators uh, to, to adjust the voltage levels because the voltage they need to be within specific limits and so on. So this is the physical system, which is the first part in our SCADA system. Uh, another part in our SCADA system is the cyber physical link, right? Because here we will connect to the next uh, component with a cyber physical link. So this cyber physical link, it can be wired or wireless. And this is basically used for, for two things. Number one, so it can carry sensors readings, it will carry the, the measurement values, the sensor readings from the physical system to the PLC. This is number one. And then number two, to send the control signals from the PLC back to the actuators in the physical system. So this is why we need the cyber physical link. Okay, So this will provide the communication between these components. The next component is the PLC. And the PLC here is short for programmable logic controller. You can think of this as a digital computer that is used for automation. Uh, the input to this PLC are the sensor readings. And then it will have a program that will take all these readings, do some calculation to figure out what will be the next control action. And then the output that will be taken from this PLC would be these command or control actions sent back to the physical system uh, to the actuators. And so inside the PLC, you'd expect to see a microcontroller. You can also see memory unit. You can see a network interface, a physical system interface, and your program. And in this example here, the program is, is, is based on ladder logic, but there are different ways to, to have this program. So far, we have seen our physical system, our cyber physical link, and then the PLC. The next part here is the network. So this network will connect the PLC with the HMI, the human machine interface. And this would allow the data exchange between the PLC, the HMI, and, 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 and then we can take some uh, human or operator enforced decisions, or we can monitor uh, the status of the current system, right? Or the current status of the system on the HMI. So we need this kind of communication, okay? So the PLC will take the sensor readings, run some program, give control actions, but also it will pass this sensor readings to what we call it the human machine interface, which at the control unit would view to the operator the current status of the system. Also, it will allow the operator to override the PLC and take some specific control actions. Okay, Like for example, regardless of the PLC, I want to disconnect this load. So I will give through the HMI a command to the PLC so that it can open a specific switch. And all of this exchange is done through this network, connecting the PLC to the HMI. 
So as we said, the HMI, which is the human machine interface, this, these are basically like graphical screens with buttons, alarms, reports, and trends about the system, the physical system. So basically, it will give the operator situational awareness because the operator now can view the current status of the system based on the readings from the sensors. And also, uh, it can provide uh, a way for the operator to interact with this system because now it can give specific commands to the PLC to take some control action on the physical system. And this is the, now the complete architecture uh, of the SCADA system, right? And this is the physical component, and this is the component that you would see in the cyber layer, and then these two are interacting the cyber and physical component through the cyber physical links. Any, any questions so far? So, so far we covered this, this part in our title where we say cyber physical critical infrastructure. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Just so that the remote people can hear. So the 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 communication, I think you shared Modbus on there. Yes, it's being used to communicate that's over and or is it RS four eighty five or some yes. other uh, I, system? I think in one of yeah, so, yeah, so, so here, the, yeah, yeah, it's it's more bus TCP. This and, might be way off topic, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole if it is, but just a quick question: if it is, um, are there error correcting codes or other ways to detect errors in that communication chain? So for you know, I'm thinking of like ECC RAM and IT systems. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think here because Modbus TCP, for example, it does not have inherently any security mechanism. So you would you would find something basic as in like a checksum or something like that. Just uh, transmission errors that you might detect. But something as in cybersecurity, there is a newer version, which is secure Modbus TCP, but like, like everything else, because the system is old and it's, it requires some upgrades, it's left with the Modbus TCP. And, and now that's why I'll show you in our test bed, we launch attacks on Modbus TCP. So we have Modbus TCP and we can launch attacks. And, and the legacy system, the old equipment in the power system, this system is like 100 years old. So there are lots of old equipment. They would be using the basic Modbus TCP. Yeah, maybe some error check because transmission errors, but nothing to enforce security. The newer version secure Modbus TCP is not necessarily implemented because it requires equipment upgrade. Thank you. So now we will view the power system as a, a, a cyber physical uh, infrastructure. And I'll show you a test bed that we developed uh, at Tennessee Tech. So now we can see the cyber and the physical components of this power system. And we will use this test bed so we can launch attacks on the system. We can collect data set because you cannot develop like deep learning intrusion detection system without data. Right? So this is how we get our data. So again, this is how our system look like. Uh, why uh, we need to protect this system. You already, there are so many growing threats uh, going on. Like for example, the, the very famous one is from December, 2015, where three Ukrainian uh, regional electricity distributors within 30 minutes from each other have been attacked. Uh, and because of this attack, they were all like tripped off and, and, and shut down. So 1.4 million customers, they lost power. Uh, and utilities were forced to move to the manual operation. They were no longer able to control and access the system through their HMI, okay? Um, and this attack was uh, due to a Black Energy 3 malware that exploited remote desktop to damage the system, erase the master boot record and some of the logs, and that's why they had to switch to the manual operation. Uh, so you can see that this is a cyber attack that impacted the physical system, and as a result, it impacted lots of uh, humans, right? Uh, their lives, and you can also consider this to affect the economy. So that's why, because these growing threats, we need to protect uh, cyber physical critical infrastructure. And in this case, it's the cyber physical power system. So in order for us to protect these systems, uh, one way to do this is through intrusion detection system, because as I said, if you want to use the, the, the secure version, like secure mode bus TCP or so, the equipment are old uh, and they won't be upgraded easily to enforce or use secure mode bus TCP, for example. So at least what you can do is to detect there are attacks going on and then interact these attacks with some prevention measures. 
So what we are doing in, in this research is to develop intrusion detection systems that can detect attacks and later on you can take preventive measures. And recently intrusion detection system have uh, witnessed lots of success being developed with machine learning techniques, especially deep machine learning techniques. And what you would need here is to develop a model and you would train this model with data. And these data would represent the two states of the system. System with normal operation, we call it benign data. And then the system under attack, we would call it, let's say, malicious data. And now you would give this to the model, the machine learning model that you would develop and train it. So basically you would show it the examples and say, this is how uh, normal data would look like. This is how malicious data due to an attack would look like. And then in the model, eventually we learn to differentiate between normal operation and malicious operation. This is the training stage. In real time, now after this model has been trained, when you integrate it into your system, it will be able to tell even when new data is coming in, whether this data is normal or malicious. But as I mentioned, in order for you to develop these intrusion detection systems based on machine learning techniques, you need to collect data sets. Okay, but you need data set of normal operation and malicious operation of your system. And if you check like on the internet, there are no publicly available data that would give you cyber physical, like data collected from both domains, cyber domain and physical domain of the power system. And also it's not necessarily uh, giving you the kind of attacks that you would desire. So eventually we were driven to develop our own test bed. Okay, so we developed our own test bed at Tennessee Tech for a cyber physical power system. And then we use this to collect the data and we implement the attacks uh, like ransomware attacks, uh, full data injection attacks, and these kind of attacks. And then we develop machine learning techniques and we see how they can efficiently detect these attacks. So this is how our cyber physical system look like. So if, if you are from the, the, the ECE kind of things like electrical and computer engineering, you'd know that power system, there are lots of standards like IEEE, bus test systems. So this would give you uh, how the generation units and the load units are connected and what is the generation capacity of the system, the Vmin, the Vmax, and all this kind of, of data. So these are called standard systems. And they have different sizes. So this one, for example, is a small system, 14 nodes. So, so these, the, the, these units that I showed you, like a generation unit and a distribution unit, in total, their number is equal to 14. So you have in total 14 nodes in this system. Okay, this is how a bus would look like. It's by this black dash. So this is a bus. And when the arrow is pointing out of the bus, then it's a load bus because it's draw power. And when the arrow is entering the bus, it's a generation unit because it inject power. And then all these buses are connected with these links, right? So these links are the ones that you see here, all these transmission lines that you can see and distribution lines. And as I said, there are different sizes of these systems. So the one that I'm showing here is the IEEE 14 bus test system. There is a larger one, IEEE 30 bus test system. And this one, we also implemented it uh, at Tennessee Tech. There is also another larger one, which is IEEE 118. So as we add more generation units and load units as the size of the system increase. Okay. So, so this is for the... The, the physical component of the system. And then in the cyber layer, we, we would have, we would represent the local network at each substation. So each substation would have a, a PLC, so it can uh, receive signals from the transmission lines and the links it's connected to and the circuit breakers. Uh, also, so it can control the circuit breakers and so on. So each power substation would have a PLC it will also have an HMI, a human machine interface, so that the, the engineer at this substation can, for example, monitor the state of the measurements for the assets controlled by this substation and can also send the command signal to control them. So we have PLC and HMI at each substation. And then we also have the one that you see in orange here is the central control unit, right? So this is where the operator or the utility company can monitor and see through a central HMI, all the other power substations, their measurement values, and can send also control signal to control all of them, okay? So this is uh, an abstract of how our system look like. Now, how we implemented it, so the physical port, which is the IEEE, for example, here, 14 bus test system, was simulated on MATLAB Simulink. So MATLAB 
uh, gives you the, the, the some blocks that you can use to model uh, a generation unit, to model a load, to model a transmission line. Uh, and we're actually doing this uh, through RT Lab and Opel RT because Opel RT give you the facility that you can do uh, real-time simulation and you can also do hardware in the loop. So what I can do is, for example, purchase a Schneider PLC and connect it to this simulation environment. And now I can have a hardware component being connected to a simulated component. Okay, so pieces or parts of my system can be a hardware. And this is what we are considering right now. Right now, what I'll show you is based that the physical system has been simulated, but we are now integrating and introducing some PLC, some actual SCADA uh, like units uh, from Schneider, uh, switches. Uh, we already have relays uh, that we are trying also to integrate. So when you launch an attack, you can actually attack the actual hardware component and then see its effect on the uh, simulation, the rest of the physical system. Uh, yeah, and this is for the, the physical uh, component. So we, we will simulate how a power system would operate. So we have here generation units. We have loads to draw the energy from these units. And we have lines to connect all these together. And we have switches so we can connect and disconnect loads from this system. And we're simulating all this operation. Uh, we, we created a physical interface so we can pull measurements. We can pull all the measurements, assuming there is a sensor, right? We said before there are sensors. These sensors will pull the measurements and then pass them to Docker containers that will eventually uh, emulate our uh, local network at each substation and then connect all these local networks together with routers until we reach the control center, okay? So we have a cyber interface to receive this signal and then uh, pass them across the routing uh, through routing tables until we reach the control, the central control center. And then the, the central control center, because it has HMI, it can then send the command signals. And now these command signals would flow through the cyber interface back to the physical interface and then control the operation of the system. Like, for example, we get a decision to open a circuit breaker or to close a circuit breaker or to inject more power and so on. Any, any questions so far? I can see something here in the chat. Questions. Okay. So this is the data flow uh, in our architecture. So first we have the, the, the human operator will provide an input. This input would go to the cyber layer virtual machine uh, to the HMI. And then through Modbus TCP, the information will be carried to the PLC. Uh, so for example, we can give a command to control the operation of a circuit breaker or something like this. And then we connect the PLC through HTTP to the cyber interface. The cyber interface is this part that will pull all this information and then pass it to the physical interface. So as I said here, this is our Opal RT or, or the, the, the emulation of our physical layer. It has the physical interface that will receive or connect to the cyber range through TCP, so establish a TCP connection, and then pass this information to the uh, simulated physical component, right? So as I said before, the human operator here can give a command to open a circuit breaker. This command will go through Modbus TCP to the PLC. Modbus TCP is a communication standard that is used specifically for uh, industrial uh, control. And in this example, it's used in our power system. So we'll carry this command from the HMI to the PLC, and then, the command would be sent from the PLC all the way to the specific switch, for example, to trip it on or off as you desire. Then we would simulate the system because now something changed in this system. So we need to recalculate how things would look like after this effect, after this change in the system. And then we would, because of this new simulation of the system after the change happened, we would pass the new measurement values, the new readings, to the physical interface, back to the cyber interface, back to the PLC, back to the HMI, so it can be viewed by the human operator, okay? So this is the complete chain from you start to take an action at the human operator back to viewing the status of the system at the human operator. Now in this system, we can collect the physical data uh, and we used Elasticsearch. It's a tool that helps us to collect all the physical data. What do I mean by physical data is the power values, right? So all these nodes that you can see, all these uh, black dashes that you can see here, they all have some voltage levels. They have specific power 
injection values or power load values. Uh, all these lines that you can see the lines here connecting one node to another, they have current flowing through them. So you can also read the current values. So all these things, I call them physical uh, data. Why? Because it is related to the physical system. These are measurements based on the physical system. Okay, so we can collect all these physical data or we can call them physical features, uh, power uh, values, voltage, current, and so on. And then we can also collect some cyber data using TCP dump and T-shirt. And the cyber data here, I mean the, the MAC addresses for the source and destination, IP addresses for the source and destination, uh, uh, packet size, all this kind of information are what we refer to as cyber data. Now I have two features in my system. So you can, if you look at this as a packet, then I am not only using the header information, I'm also using the payload value itself, right? So I'm fusing in my intrusion detection system, these two things. I will look at the payload value and I will look at the header information. And all these things I'll train my machine learning model using these features, right? If you are familiar with this field and you uh, do uh, a literature review, you would find that there are two kind of scientists or researchers worker in this, working in this area. Either they are completely uh, electrical and computer engineering people with pure power system background, and so they only use the physical measurements to infer or detect attacks. And there are, at the other side, people from pure cybersecurity, and what they would do is to use this header information, cyber information, in order to detect intrusion. Like, for example, something like Snort. So Snort would look at all these header information and then tell you if there is an attack or not. What we are doing here is fusing both. We will use the physical information, we will use the cyber information and fuse them both and infer whether an attack is happening or not. And towards the end of, of this workshop, I'll show you that this actually will improve the detection performance. So you can attack, uh, you can detect the attacks with higher uh, detection rate and lower false alarm. Uh, yeah. Any any questions so far? Yes. Do you use um, data diodes or anything like that to keep, prevent from creating any more? Not in this work. Not so I, I teach about it in my class, but okay. not in this work. <laughs> yeah, I teach a course on on cyber physical security. Uh, and this course actually was, was was originally like part of a bigger, uh, there were like four universities led by uh, Dr. Tommy Maurice at University of Alabama Hensville. And all of them, they, they uh, did this course, Cyber Physical Security. Uh, also, I teach another course at Tennessee Tech, which is deep learning and, and, and deep machine learning techniques. Uh, and because of my background in ECE, machine learning, cyber security, now, now I can... Uh, at least share share my my vision with you. Okay, so so this is let's see the the components of our system in more details. Like for example, when I talk about the simulated I triple E fourteen bus test system, this is how it would look like. Part of it, not the whole system. The whole system wouldn't fit in in this page. So this is just one part in the MATLAB Simulink. So this node here that uh, that I'm showing you, this one here is a generator unit, right? So so when I when you look at one. Let, let's see, what, this is a generation unit, okay? Because the arrow here is injecting power, right? So this is a generation uh, unit. And this is the equivalent of this generation unit on MATLAB, okay? Simulink, it will give you the generation power. As you can see, this is the generator. So this is here how the generator in MATLAB would look like. And if, if you have some electrical uh, system background, then you know that we use three phase uh, system. Our systems are three phase. So you see these three links here, or these three wires, connected to this bus. Okay, so this is here the bus, and this is now our uh, circuit breaker. Okay, so this would connect the generator to the bus, or disconnect this generator from the bus. So if this switch is closed, now your generator is connected to the power grid, right? When you open the switch, now your, your generator is disconnected from the power grid. And then it will carry because now you can see here there is a wire or a link connecting one bus to another. So this is how the wire would look like. It's like an RLC resistance in and coil and capacitor connecting like these uh, two buses together. And this bus here is a load bus, right? Because it's drawing 
power as you can see here it's drawing power so this is a load bus and again the load the the the, the load itself is connected through a switch to the network right so again you can open or close this switch and now you can have your load connected or disconnected from the power grid right and now you can you can just imagine or vision that this that you can see here the basic system that you see here is now just duplicated and replicated with all the number of nodes that you have in the system right you will always have a generator connected with a switch to a bus and then a bus is connected to another bus with a branch and then the other bus is, if it is a load bus it's connected to a switch and then to a load right and all these switches you can control them with the plc to connect or disconnect generation units and loads from the system uh, in order for us to, to generate data, because when I, when I speak of deep machine learning techniques, we need to be able to collect lots of data from the system. So to collect lots of data, and these data represent various scenarios, so we have a varying load profile. What are these load profiles? This is how we consume energy at home, for example, right? So the way this looks like is roughly like a sine wave. Why? Because with, with our electricity consumption, let's say late night, there is very low or minimal consumption. And then it starts to increase until it reaches the peak of the day. And then we are back again to decrease until we reach the minimum. And then we keep increasing again and so on. So this is roughly like a sinusoidal kind of wave. So at each load, at each load that we have in this system, we simulate this behavior. And we simulate it for six months, right? So we have like six months kind of load profile that will mimic the behavior of how we consume energy at these loads, okay? And, and this is a realistic, I think we got it from uh, a load profile in Canada. It was publicly available. And then we used this load profile and we replicated at different nodes. Now to make this load profile, these load profiles would always look like sine wave. They, they will always look like that, but we need to introduce some variance. So it's not just identical at all loads. And this makes sense because at some neighborhood there is in all, like in total, higher consumption than other neighborhoods and so on. So that's why we, we add some uniform random variable with some mean and variance. So now we can make these load profile. Yes, they look all like sine wave, but they have different values at different loads. And then we simulate the system, right, with this load profile. When you do that, you will generate all these physical data that you need, right? Because the, the system here will solve some power flow equations. And from these power flow equation will give you what would be the injected power, the current flow, the phase uh, angle, the frequency of the system, all this information for this specific load value, right? And then you change the load value and we'll do the calculation and give you the, the, the corresponding features and so on. And we do this for six months, so we have lots of data to train our model. And this data, they mimic the behavior of people at different setups, morning, night, weekday, weekend, uh, summer, like different seasons, right? And so on. So this is for the, the physical part. This is how we collect the data from the physical part. And this is uh, then uh, all the data collected from different nodes, because you can see we have so many nodes, as you can see here. So we collect the voltage, power, all these values, uh, all of them, and then pass this to a multiplexer. And then the multiplexer is connected with an Ethernet communication interface to the cyber layer. So it is this physical interface. This physical interface is what I'm showing you here. OK, so it just collect all the measurements from the system pass it to a multiplexer, and then this multiplexer at specific time periods will pass this through an Ethernet connection to our cyber layer, right? And the cyber layer now, it has the PLC, the HMI, put everything in forms of Modbus TCP and carry this to the uh, main control center uh, HMI. So this is if you want to send something to the cyber range. So you have your physical system, you collected the data, and you pass the data to the cyber range, to, to the uh, cyber layer. Now, if you want to receive a command from the cyber layer, because as you can see, this is the flow where we give a command, right? So if you want to send a command to the physical system, then what we do is we take commands uh, from the system. We take the command from the cyber layer. Then we try to de decode this command to understand this command is directed to which circuit breaker, for example, I want to open a circuit breaker. So which circuit breaker are we talking about? So we identify the IDs of these circuit breakers and then give them the command to open or close. This is our cyber layer and the cyber layer is just Docker containers connected by a Docker network. And so we have, as we said before, the substation local network, which would give you HMI and PLC. And the relay is just to pass the physical measurements to our elastic search, which collect the measurement values. Uh, and then this, this information pulled from the system, 
will be sent from the substation to the router, right? So for example, here I have PLC and HMI at the substation. This is the local network at the substation. It will connect through a, a router to the rest of the network. And then through the routing tables, we can pass this information to the main control center. How did we connect these routers together? So we connected these routers together. Uh, we created a synthetic network. And, and this synthetic network, it follow what we call it a scale-free network with this power load distribution. So this is identifying just the nodal degree. So each node here, we can identify how many other nodes it is connected to, right? So we create just a system with this number of routers, and then we create the nodal degree based on this distribution, and then we start to connect all the nodes together. Why did we follow this power load distribution? Because uh, actual network are scale-free, and they follow this kind of distribution. So this is now our cyber layer. How did we identify where is the control center? So the control center would be the node with the highest degree. Okay, in this example, there are different ways to identify the control center. For example, something called between centrality and so on. But in this work, we use the highest nodal degree to be our control center. So what I have shown you so far, it established the physical layer and its own connectivity, right? Based on the IEEE 14 bus test system standard. And it established the cyber layer and its own connectivity based on the power load distribution and nodal degrees. And we also have two interfaces that can connect these two together. But how can we identify which bus here is connected directly to which router, right? So to do that, we use something called random positive degree correlation. And this is the reason why we use it, because it mimics real-world coupling, right? So there are some research that has been done, and they found whenever you have coupled systems, Usually they uh, use this approach random, or usually they follow this approach random positive degree correlation, where the nodes with highest degree here are connected to the nodes with the highest degree here, and vice versa. Okay, so this is how we couple uh, the the each bus to a specific router, and this actually gives us the the complete system. So as you can see now in our system, we have simulated or emulated the the the, the power. Subsystem, or oh, sorry, the power system with its generation units, loads, and links connecting them. And this has been simulated on the MATLAB Simulink, and we use the Opal RT so we can do real time simulations and we can later on integrate some hardware components to the system. And also, we have seen the, the cyber layer with the cyber range where we host all the uh, routers and do the routing of this data. And these two are connected through these interfaces, physical interface and cyber interface. So we can carry measurement from the physical system to the cyber layer and control center. And then the control center, when viewing the status of the system, it can run some algorithms and computation, like let's say power flow analysis or unit commitment, and then give command signals to control some of the assets in this physical system. Okay. Yeah. Any question? Yes. Um, I was wondering this fourth bus uh, how many passengers each bus represents? Yeah, this is this is a very good question. So this is there are two types of the IEEE bus test system. One of them is called uh, transmission system, which does not give you this number of customers, but give you a bulk power. So it will just say that you have a substation. This substation distribute power to this value. So this can be, for example, a complete neighborhood. OK? Yes. OK, or, or, or can be a city, thousands, right? These are called transmission system. Now, there is something else that is called a distribution system, which bring the, this back to the scale of the single customer. Yeah, I'm not assuming this is a transmission system because it follows the IEEE 14 bus test system, right? So there are, in the IEEE standard, something called a transmission system, like the IEEE 14, 30, and 118, all these are transmission systems. And there is something else called distribution systems, which are IEEE 9, IEEE 34, and so on, right? So there are different systems. Why we choose the transmission system? Because this would be more catastrophic to attack if I disconnected a generator, I actually cut power from a complete like city, for example, right? But in a distribution level, it will be contained to, let's say, a small neighborhood or, or something like that. So we chose to do our study on a transmission system. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, another question on the previous slide. You had, um, on the right side, you have four 
Yeah, this, yeah. True, true. No, you're absolutely true. This is a picture from something else. I just want to show you that my system is a physical layer, a cyber layer, and some coupling between them. This is not for the 14. I, I didn't have the one from the 13. This one from 118 or something like that. Yes, good catch. Yeah. In, any other question? Yes, please. Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, I, I I would have to check the, the I'm thesis. Assuming I this was after you were already up, or I don't know, maybe you were out there. Did you hear him check. barking up a storm? Maybe you were in a this morning. That was up this morning. Sorry? That was like at like six or so, I think. What was that? What was that? I let them uh, in. Yeah, you can. I, mean, I was like, oh, I so think. No, no, no. I, I was like, he was away. It was like, shut up. Give you all these values. What's the power factor? Maybe? It will give you but the maximum uh, generation capacity bird? of the uh, generation units. It would give you, if there are some losses, are what are the RNC are factors? I, for the branches you know, so you can. Sleep like that? I mean, I was, I was still sleeping. It's like, what the hell is your problem? Was it the trash? No, they came around seven. I don't think it was the trash yet. I don't think so either, because yeah, I think before the trash. Not from mine. Not from mine. Not, yeah. not from he wouldn't mine. shut up because either. Yeah. 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 I will. Uh, oh. Sounds good to it's like he did that. Remember the day after Will was Hi, here? Hi, oh, Lou. Oh, he must have been having a night. Lou? That was like, Smith? Like, Lou? Right. Anyway. <laughs> you can stay yeah, too bad because if they respond, you say we can see you. Stop what you're doing. Okay. There's a button on the keyboard on the laptop. My laptop. I see. But this is already. I I already. He's already muted. I, I already muted mine. Yeah. Oh, that's alright. Um, they they might have muted themselves. I am so sorry for the interruption, everybody. Yeah, Lou. Okay, they've muted themselves. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So 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 in answering your question, all the values related to the power factor related to the RLC values for the branches. The maximum generation unit, the Vmin, Vmax, all these values are from the standard. So the, the IEEE, they give you something called the data sheet. And this data sheet will show you the connectivity, the adjacency matrix, and all the values that you need to run the simulation. This is in the 14 bus, and you will get the same with whatever the, the, the size of your system. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think we have a coffee break at 10.30. At is that right? Yeah, so we are exactly at 10.30 and we can stop for, for coffee break. This is the system. I'll show you next how we use this system to collect data from, and then I'll, I'll do more hands-on approach in the next part to show you how to use this data to train machine learning models so they can detect, for example, manipulation in the data. Thank you very much. No, it should be much less. Don't say it's 30 minutes. <laughs> it's 10 minutes? Yeah, so I think 10 minutes break yeah. and then we come back here okay. okay thank you very much yeah uh, yeah just sh share the slides with with the organizers and you will upload it on the webs yeah, I'll put it on my agenda. yeah so it will be uploaded on the agenda where you, you will have access to this slide uh, and also in the slide you will find links for codes because as i said part of this workshop we will run some uh, python scripts so you can train and test machine learning models for intrusion detection. So you can access also these codes uh, from the slides. Uh, in fact, uh, what I did is I took one hour and 15 minutes ride from the city where I live to the airport, and then five hour flight, and then a train, one hour. The only thing I didn't take was a boat. Uh, I took everything that's possible to take. So I can show up here and say that this is what we do, and we would be happy to collaborate if you are interested in any of these, right? So this this is why I came here today. So I shared with you what we do, and we are happy and open to collaborate. Anyway, so what we did so far is to establish our test bed of a cyber physical power system. You have seen the, the physical layer, the, the, the cyber layer, and now we can use this test bed to collect data. 
So in order for us to collect data, we need two different types of data. One of them we call it the benign data. The benign data, and this benign data represents the system normal operation. So this is a normal power system when there is no attack, right? So as I said before, we have a load profile to mimic like six months of normal load behavior. And then we run the system with this six months load profile. And then we collect our cyber physical data, the physical data through Elasticsearch, the cyber data through uh, T-Shark and, and TCP dump. Um, and now we, we have all these features that represent the normal operation of the system. Now, the, the other part of the data are the malicious data, where we again will run the system with the six month load profile, but under some attacks. Okay, and now you can do whatever attack you would want because you have the test bed. In our study, we consider this bunch of attacks. So basically what we are trying to do is to control the circuit breakers, to connect and disconnect generators and loads from the system. So we did a false data injection attack where we inject a false command to switch off the circuit breakers. We can do also a backdoor attack where we created a backdoor to access the HMI and then send a command to switch off a circuit breaker. We do a brute force where we try to break the, the like the password of the HMI and again to access this HMI and, and switch off circuit breakers. We do reverse shell operator to, to operation so we can disable the PLC again to switch off a circuit breaker. We do a ransomware attack where we just simulate or emulate a communication lock between the PLC and the HMI, right? So you can no longer send control to the physical system or receive monitoring signal from the uh, physical system. So we just disable the Modbus TCP communication. And then we collect this data. So when you collect the data, they happen at different frequency, right? The rate of the data is different. So in the cyber data, it is more frequent than the physical data. So what we did here is just imputation of the physical data. So for example, this is physical data number one. Let's say that this is power measurement value at timestamp T1. And all these cyber data here now are generated. So what we do is to repeat the same power data. It's some sort of just to fill in the blank, right? Now your cyber and physical features, we call them in machine learning, we call them features. So the cyber and physical features are synchronized and, and uh, you have same number of rules of cyber data and physical data. So the machine learning model can use them to uh, be trained and be able to differentiate and identify attacks and normal operations. So what are the features that we have collected? So if it is a cyber feature, we collected the source and destination MAC addresses, the source and destination IP addresses, the packet size, the protocol, the source and destination port numbers, and the for TCP and UDP. For the physical features, we collected the voltage values. Uh, as I mentioned, our systems are three phase systems. So the real power system are three phase. So we have three phase voltage values for each node in our system. We also have three phase current values for each node in the system. What's the frequency of this system? For example, 60 Hertz. And then what is the phase angle, angle theta? Because this voltage is a complex uh, number. So it has a magnitude and also it has a phase angle. And then what are the active and reactive power? Uh, P and Q values, okay? So these are all the features that we have collected in our system. And now we will use these features to train the machine learning models. So eventually they will be able to identify and differentiate between normal operation and the system being run under attack. So very briefly, we will just make a brief introduction to what is machine learning, and then we will talk more about deep models. Uh, so first, the, the definition of machine learning, according to Arthur Samuel in 1959, is that in this field, you give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So normally you would program a computer to do something, but here, no, you teach the computer because you don't have clear rules on how to differentiate here between uh, attack and normal. So you just provide the computer with data and say this example is an attack, this example is a normal operation. So you just try to teach the computer how, to, how the data look like, and then it will learn from this data to differentiate between the two cases. So one example here is with the checkers game. So you have ten, tens of thousands of games being played. And then the computer would eventually learn from all these games which board positions lead to win and which board positions lead to lose. And it will learn over time 
the good and bad strategies. And so eventually it uh, can play checkers better than the developer himself, okay? So what we say here is that they learn from experience or they generate experience. By looking at all this data, it will create experience and now it can do the job better than, as I said, the, the developer himself. So uh, the, a more like uh, a well posed definition of the machine learning problem by Tom Mitchell in 1998 is that the computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and some performance measure P. And so its performance on this task as measured by P will improve with the experience. Like let's say for example, in these checker games, the experience for the computer comes from playing tens of thousands of games. And the task it's doing is to play checkers. And so P, which is the performance measure, is the probability of winning the next game. So as it keep growing in experience, the probability of winning the next game will increase. So in our case, we have some metrics. And these metrics, let's say, we call them the detection probability. What's the probability to be able to detect that this is an attack? Something else called a false alarm. It's not an attack, but you flagged it as an attack. So these are our performance measures. So we will give the machine learning model lots of data and keep monitoring these detection rates and false alarm in hoping that, not in hoping, in aiming that the detection rate would increase and the false alarm would decrease with more over time until it grew its experience. And now we use it to detect these attacks. Again, another example is the spam filter. The task is to classify emails as spam or not. The experience is to watch the user label these emails as spam or not. And then the probability is the fraction of emails being correctly classified by the model of being spam or not, okay? So these are the different branches of machine learning models. They are categorized into three categories, supervised machine learning models, unsupervised machine learning models, and reinforcement learning. And today we will talk about the supervised and unsupervised learning. In the supervised learning, what you have is labeled data, which means when you have uh, the data and it is already labeled as being benign or malicious. So I would give the machine learning model some examples of cyber features and physical features, and then I'll say the label of this set of features is normal. Okay, and then I give it another set of features and I say the labels of these features are malicious. So I'm giving the, the model some examples with their labels, like asking a question and also providing the answer, right? Because it will learn from these features and their answers to be able eventually to do this on its own without knowing what's the answer. So this is supervised learning. This is, this is what is called supervised learning. It uses labeled data. And here, as I said, the right answers are given. So for, for each feature, we know the right class. One example here is in network analysis, like if I give you a bunch of packets and I want you to tell me if these data packets are malicious or benign. So for example here, every, thing, every circle in green represents a benign packet size. And then when it go beyond that, maybe that's a malware, maybe that's a malicious kind of, of, of data packet, and we mark it with X. And there is here a, a, a threshold that would classify the packet according to its size for being benign or malicious. So what I would give the machine learning model would be a size of a packet and I say it's benign, a size of another packet and I say it's benign and so on. And some sizes and I say they are malicious. And then the machine learning model would learn how to create this threshold to be able to classify benign and malicious. Now, the one that you see here is based on a single feature, which is the packet size. So what if we have more features than, for example, if we have two features as in the packet rate and the packet size, this is how our threshold would look like. It's now in 2D and you can have more, right? Based on how many features you would have. The problem that we are talking about here is called the classification problem, right? Because your final outcome, what you would like your machine learning model to learn is just to give a discrete value at the output saying that this example is benign, let's say, we mark it as zero, or malicious, we mark it as one. So this is a discrete valued output that you would eventually have. And this is called the classification problem. Because in machine learning, there is another problem, which is a prediction problem, where you try to predict the next value, which is a real value. Like, for example, I know the temperature for today, and I want to predict the temperature for tomorrow, right? So this is a prediction problem. But what we are dealing with here is a classification problem. I want to classify uh, the features as either being benign or malicious. 
So this is supervised learning and we have labeled data. So what if we have unlabeled data, like I only have benign data, I don't have attack data, okay? So then I would just use my unlabeled data in an unsupervised framework. And here what I will try to learn is the pattern of the normal data, how normal data normally or usually look like, right? How the pattern of the normal data would look like. And then any deviation from this pattern, I'd flag it as being malicious. So this is unsupervised. I will only use the benign data to train my model. So if it is unsupervised, I will use the benign and malicious data and the labels. And I will make the model create the threshold that classify these data from each other. If it is unsupervised, I only have benign data, right? And this, by the way, usually makes sense because I'm not going to have a database of all the attacks in the world, right? So maybe I just create an, an uh, something trained on the normal data, try to, or the benign data, try to capture the pattern in this data and flag any deviation as a threat or an attack. So this is the difference in the training. So when I'm training a supervised model, this is a supervised model, I'll use the benign and the malicious data, and I'll tell the model also what is the class. This is during training, right? And then when I'm doing the testing, because there are two phases in machine learning, training where you give so many examples to the model so that it can learn uh, how to differentiate the two classes and then testing you give it a new data it haven't it hasn't seen before and then you ask it what would be the class right so now you are testing your model this is in the supervised in the unsupervised you would only give the model the benign data and it will learn the behavior or, or the pattern of this uh, benign data and now in testing, you would give it new data. This data could be benign or malicious. And you ask it, is it benign or malicious? Can you sense a deviation from the normal pattern based on some threshold? If yes, then it's malicious. If no, then it's benign. So this is not by any means a comprehensive list of all the available models, but these are some of the models that we usually use in, in my research team. Uh, this is not an insult when I say a shallow model. It's very good, it's very effective, it's very efficient, right? But it has limits, and you can improve the performance with deep models, right? So support vector machine is a very good model, it's very effective, but you can do better with deep machine learning models. Deep machine learning models, I categorize them as supervised and unsupervised. The supervised version, one of them, which is the basic one, is a feed-forward neural network. And why we say deep? Because as you will see in the structure, this is structured as layers. And the more layers you add, the deeper your model is. And it can capture more pattern in your data and do better classification job. So one type is feed-forward neural network. This is the basic one. This one does not exploit any correlation dependencies within the data, right? So our data is time series data. The power value at T1 is related to the power value at T2, at T3, it's not normal at some point that the power value is zero and then suddenly I see an abrupt pulse of 1,000 volts. This is not normal. It's gradual increase, gradual decrease, and so on. So there is dependencies over time between the data. The feed-forward neural network model will not capture this time dependencies. It just take the data as it is, train the model, and, and give the answer. If you want to capture the temporal dependencies within the data, then you need a recurrent neural network model. This model will exploit the temporal correlation and give you a better detection performance if your data is time series data that has these temporal dependencies. Another model that also exploits some correlation within the data is called the convolutional neural network. This is used mainly with uh, image recognition, object recognition, because it captures correlation within the, the image itself. But you can also apply the same concept to time series data, right? And again, exploit the correlation within the data to do better detection job. Now, the most I would say advanced or recent one is a graph convolutional neural network because our system, which is the power system, you can always view it as a graph. These nodes are your power substations and these links are the transmission lines connecting the stations together. So you can actually view your system as a graph and your data is not just time series data. It's a graph structured data. Each label, each, sorry, each node has data associated with it. And there is special dependencies between these nodes, right? This is done with Kirchhoff voltage law, Kirchhoff current law, power flow equations, if you are familiar with uh, ECE concept and electrical system. But adjacent nodes, they would affect each other. And it's not normal that they do not satisfy some specific uh, laws of physics for how the electricity would flow across the network, 
right? So the graph convolutional neural network would capture this special dependencies between the nodes. Okay, so as you can see, we, we increase the complexity of the models. The first one feed forward neural network, it will not exploit any temporal correlation or a special correlation. It will just, you'll give it the data, it will try to learn the relationship between them and then just do the detection. The recurrent and convolutional neural network, they will exploit some temporal correlation within the data. If this data has time dependencies between the samples, it will try to capture this time dependencies and do better job in the detection. The graph, Neural network model would not only capture the correlation within the time series data, but also the spatial dependencies between one node and the other. And this is captured by, by what we call it the adjacency matrix, how these nodes are connected with each other. And all these models that I'm showing you here are all supervised. Uh, why supervised? Because when I'm training them, I will give the model the benign data and say it's benign, malicious data and say it is malicious, right? This is during the training stage. And when the training is complete, I'll give it a sample it hasn't seen before and ask it, what is this? Is this benign or malicious? Okay. And based on this testing, I will collect information and then calculate what is my detection rate? How many of these samples have been correctly detected as attacks? And what is my false alarm? How many of these samples were not attacks, but I raised a flag that, uh, that this is uh, an attack? Okay. These are all supervised. Now, the unsupervised version in the deep learning model these are, in my work at least, are based on autoencoders. Okay, what is an autoencoder? An autoencoder is a feed forward, a form. I'll show you that it looks different. A form of a feed forward neural network, but we will train it only with benign data, and we will be able to use it to capture some characteristics inside our data, and then any deviation we say this is malicious. Okay, and it is deep because, again, it's a bunch of layers, and you can add more layers and capture more pattern inside your data. This one will not capture any correlation within the data, but the recurrent version of it, recurrent autoencoder, it will capture temporal dependencies within the data. We can also have a graph autoencoder that is trained on the graph and it will capture the special dependencies and temporal dependencies within the data. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to cover all the models, but as I said, the slides, uh, they will be uploaded on the, the program and they have all the models and they have they are uploaded already okay so i can't figure out how to get it on the agenda yet but if you are on slack in the community the 2023 summit community channel um i have linked them there so so how much time do we have because i forgot Okay, so we still have one and a half hour. Okay, thank you. So as I said, I, I'll not be able probably to go through all these, uh, but in the slides, you will find information about them and you will find codes. So we will cover codes maybe for a feed-forward neural network as an example of a supervised model and feed-forward autoencoder as an example of unsupervised model. And you will find that these codes are very well structured that they will always look like this. I will always import libraries, import data, then do some pre-processing, then train my model, then test my model, do performance metrics. It, it, they all look, look alike, okay? So uh, first the data. So the data uh, set, the first thing you need to know about it is we need to know the number of training examples, like how many rows do we have? And then something else, the features. How many features do you have? So your data, it's like in a tabular format. Rows represent the number of samples and columns would represent number of features. And then you have something else called a label, right? So this is a feature and this is a label. The label will tell you the class. It is one if it is malicious, it is zero if it is benign. And so the combination of the X, which is the feature and the Y, which is the label would give you a complete training example. What's the feature and what's the corresponding label? And as you said before, your, your example or your like feature plus the label can be time series because this is, for example, how the power would evolve over time. So this is an active power value, and this is how it evolved over time, and there is some time dependencies between one sample and another. This is time series data. Uh, and this one in orange is the, the, the malicious example, and this one in blue, it is the benign example. So here we injected some full data injection, like we changed the value of the reading. 
So if you have multiple features, as I said before, this is one feature, and then you can have another feature, another feature, another feature, and so on, and then eventually you end up with a label, uh, and the N are the number of features, and the M are the number of examples, and the complete example is all these features plus the label. Now your data set, when you deal with it, you need to split your data for machine learning model. So you split the data part for training, which will use it to train the model. And then a completely different part, you can use it for testing, okay? Imagine that you are in classroom and you give your students a bunch of questions and answers for them to practice on. If you get the same questions in the exam, then you actually haven't tested their ability to learn anything, right? You just, just they memorize these question and answer and provide the same thing. This is not learning, right? So we do the same here. We split our data set into two partitions. One of them is for training and then another part is for testing. Testing with unseen data. We never used them before in the training part. Now the training data, we will use it to learn what we call it the model parameter. And another part of the training data, we will call it validation, which we use it to optimize some of the hyperparameters or to tune our model to improve its performance. And I'll show you what do I mean by a model parameter and a hyperparameter. When you get your data and you split them into train and test, also another thing you need to do in case your data has multiple features is to bring all the features to the same scale. Like let's say you have some, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, the power is in watt and it's just thousands, but let's say the voltage is very high volt, tens of thousands. I'm just trying to, to give some numbers. So there are different scales, something to the 10 power four, something else 10 power three, something else 10 power, 10 power two. So these are completely different scales. It will give you a hard time to make your model learn anything. So what we normally do is to bring all these features to the same scale. How do we do that? How we bring them all to the same scale? We can do something like normalization. And now all the values will be from zero to one, right? So you, you go to each feature, you find what is the maximum value along this feature and what is the minimum, and then you apply this relation here. You take the value, subtract it from the minimum and divide it by maximum minus. You are normalizing your data. And now all the features after, after you are done doing this will be a value from zero to one. Or you can do a standardization. And now your data is from minus one to one. You figure out what is the mean along the feature, what is the standard deviation, and then you take the feature value, subtract it from the mean, and divide it by the standard deviation. Now you, you will scale from minus one to one. Now all the features would have the same scale, right? Regardless, they are physical, they are cyber, they are whatever, they will be all from scale from zero to one if it is normalized, or minus one to one if it is standardized. So the first step is to import our data. The second step, is to split them into train and test. The third step is to normalize our data to bring all the features to the same level. Then also there is another stage towards the end, which is the testing stage. Now to, you need to evaluate your model. Because this is a classification kind of problem, we create something called the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix would tell me the relationship between the actual class and the predicted class by the model. So for example, this is, we have two classes in our case, benign and malicious. Benign is zero, malicious is one. This is the actual class. And this is zero and one for the predicted class. If it is malicious and you predict it to be malicious, then it's called a true positive, right? So your actual class is malicious and your model predicted this to be malicious. So we call it a true positive. If it is actually uh, benign and the model predicted to be malicious, it's called a false positive and so on. If it is one predicted to be zero, it's a false negative. If it is zero predicted to be zero, that's a true negative. This is called the confusion matrix. You are counting the instances when your model did right and did wrong. And now using this confusion matrix, you can calculate so many performance metrics. One of them is called the precision. Another one is called the recall. Another one called an F1 score. Another one is called an accuracy. The easiest one is the accuracy. So what's the true positive and true negative as a percentage of all your predictions? True positive means it was attack and you predict it to be an attack. True negative, it's benign and you said it's benign. So what's the fraction where you did right, okay? Uh, precision would say out of all predicted positive cases, what fraction was actually positive, right? Recall would say of all actual positive cases, what fraction is correctly predicted and so on. These are different metrics based on your confusion matrix. 
And the one, if your data is unbalanced, the one, the one metric that will do very well is an F1 score, which is a geometric mean between precision and recoil. There is also something called the area under the curve. Again, if it is high, then your model is doing good. If it is low, then your model is doing bad. These are different metrics. All of them are based on the confusion metrics. And we use this at the testing stage. OK, so we will start with the first model. It's supervised feed-forward neural network. But be before I move on, any question about the machine learning part? Did this introduction so far? OK. So let's start with the feed-forward neural, feed neural network. This is the most basic uh, neural network model, right? Because from this concept, they come up with the recurrent, and from there, they went to the convolutional and so on. So, so the, the most basic one would be the feed-forward neural network. Let's say that I have this kind of data. Uh, depending on the, the packet length and the packet rate, so these are two features. If it is these values, I would call that this a benign example and if it they are these values i would call them malicious okay and when i plot this x1 let's say it's the length of the packet and the x2 correspond to the rate of the packet and then when i start to plot all these values i can now classify them like this these are the malicious ones and these are the benign ones in the neural network i'll have something called an input layer which are my features Right? What are the features, the packet length, and the packet rate? And an output layer. This output layer would tell me what's the likelihood that this is benign or malicious. Right. So I have now two layers. One is the input feature, and the other one is the output label. And I will connect all of these together. Okay. So here, B, for example, which is the likelihood of being benign, depends on the packet size and packet rate with the specific weights W1 and W2. So I would take the packet size, x1, multiplied by some weight of importance. Is the packet size an important factor to tell that this is benign or not? So this is the weight. It gives the importance of the feature. So I take x1 multiplied by w1, and also I will add it to x2 and multiply it by w2. x2 is the packet rate, right? So is the packet rate important? What's the importance of the packet rate to tell me if this is a benign packet or not? So now b is the combination of x1 and x2 in a weighted this is now B, the likelihood of being benign. I'll do the same with M, the likelihood of being malicious. I'll take X1 multiplied by W3 and X2 multiplied by W4 and add them, and this gives me the likelihood of being malicious. Now, the model would say that this is a benign sample if the likelihood of B is greater than the likelihood of M. So if this part here, oh no, here the example I gave was for M. So the model would say that this is malicious if the likelihood of M is greater than the likelihood of B. This is the definition of malicious. It's W3X1 plus W4X2. This is the definition of benign. And if this term is greater than this term, I'd say that this is a malicious example. Now we will just rearrange the terms here. So I'll put X1, and this is a common, W3 minus W1, and I'll take X2 as another common, and it's W4 minus W2. And this is just a line, right? This is a line, and these are the, give, give me the slope of this line. Right? And this is actually the line that I'm eventually trying to create here, a threshold to separate these two from each other. Every time you would give an example of x1 and x2, it will start to learn the slope of this line. Because okay, so your model, when you keep passing to it, what's the packet length value, what is the rate value, it will start to adjust and learn what should be the correct slope of this line. Now, there is one problem here with this line, is that this line passes through the origin. Right? Because this is an equation of a line that passes through the origin. But our desirable threshold is not passing through the origin. It's intersecting the y-axis and the x-axis. How can we do that? How can we make our model not necessarily pass through the origin? We add something called a bias term, B. Okay. So here I'll add, these are the features, x1, x2. And I'll add uh, an additional neuron. These, by the way, we call them neurons. So I'll add an additional neuron. I'll say it's plus one. And I multiply it by B1, and I multiply it by B2. B is a bias. This is what will give me the intersection with the x-axis and the y-axis. So now, if I rewrite my equations, the likelihood of being benign is x1 multiplied by w1, everything in red, OK? 
x1 multiplied by w1, x2 multiplied by w2, and 1 multiplied by b1. So it's b1, right? So this is now how my equation would look like. Same thing for m, the likelihood of being malicious. It's x1 multiplied by w3, x2 multiplied by w4, and 1 multiplied by b2, right? Again, what's the likelihood of being, of saying that this is, so, sorry, when the model would say that this is a malicious sample, it's when the likelihood of being malicious is greater than the likelihood of being benign. And again, if you arrange it, your terms, you would find that this is W3, W1 multiplied by X1, W4, W2 multiplied by X2, and now you have this term here, right? Now you have a slope and you have a constant. This constant is what will give you the intersection with the X-axis and the Y-axis. So every time you provide uh, an example, it will start to adjust the slope, okay? You would give it X1, X2, one example, another, and this is benign. Another example, this is malicious. Another example, this is benign, and so on. It will start to learn how to rotate and adjust the slopes and the intersections with the x and y axis. So we are trying to learn the values of these weights and bias values. W1, W2, W3, W4. These are the connections between the neurons because this is an input neuron, this is an output neuron, and these are the connections between the neurons, okay? And we also try to learn the bias values, B. These are what we call the model parameters. So when we try to train a model, we try to figure out what are the weight and bias values for our model. And we learn these from the examples we provide. Any questions so far? So everything we have done here just give me a line, right? Because this is an equation of a straight line with some slope and intersecting the x and y axis. But what if my decision boundary is actually uh, a curve, right? So if these are the malicious and these are the benign, and I, I shouldn't learn a line because a line will not separate them well. I need to learn something nonlinear, like a curve. So in order to do that, instead of just defining our model with an input layer and an output layer, we will start to introduce what we call it a hidden layer, okay? So now our model, the machine, the neural network model will have an input layer, an output layer, and some neurons in the middle, we call them the hidden layer. And we will start to connect again, these are the biases, at each layer I will add a bias, and we'll start to connect all the neurons with each others. If you start now to write the values, first you'll figure out what is A1, everything in green, so X1 multiplied by W1, X2 multiplied by W2, and the bias, this is A1. You do the same with A2, you do the same with A3, and then pass this to B, right? So B now is a combination based on A1, A2, A3. So these hidden layers just process the data and pass it to the next one. And that's why we call it a feed forward, right? Because every layer would process the data and pass it to the next layer, and so on until we reach the output. Now, what would be the likelihood that this is um, the, okay. You have a question? Not to me? Okay. I, I think you already... Yeah, he muted himself. Okay. We're good. So what's the likelihood of being malicious? So, uh, sorry, when the model would classify this as a malicious example, it's when M is greater than B. So this is the definition of M, this is the definition of B, but these are still linear equations, right? Yes, I added a hidden layer in the middle, but everything is still linear. How can I make this nonlinear? We make this nonlinear with something called uh, an activation function. So whenever A1, A2, A3, process the input features, they will not pass them as linear combinations to the next layer. No, they will apply a nonlinear function and then pass this to the next layer. So here we have the input features, then we find weighted some of them at the hidden layer, then we will apply a nonlinear function, like a sigmoid function, uh, a tanj function, something that is nonlinear. And then pass this to the next layer. So now we added nonlinearity in our model. And now we can learn a curve, our threshold can be a curve, a nonlinear curve, rather than being a line, a straight line to separate these from each other. And again, by learning the weights, uh, W weights and the bias values B, the orientation of this curve would change until you reach the desirable threshold. 
okay so what we have learned now is that we have for the neural network an input layer bunch of hidden layers so far I, I show you one hidden layer but you can add as many as you want and this would make your model a deep model and now you have further processing of the data at intermediate stages and all of these are nonlinear processing of the data and they will extract more information from the data to give a more accurate detection performance so we have an input layer hidden layer and the output layer. The number of neurons in the input layer are equal to the number of features that you have. In this example, I had only two features, but depending on your problem, you can have as many features as you want. And then in the hidden layer, you choose what are the number of neurons. That's your choice. So we call it a hyperparameter. Okay? It's something related to the structure of this model. At the output layer, you have two classes, then you have two neurons. Each one will tell you the likelihood to have this class. If you have multiple classes, then you add neurons at the output layer depending on the number of your classes. Another hyperparameter is the number of layers. How many layers should I have? I can have two layers, three hidden layers. These hidden layers, I can add two, three, four. It's another hyperparameter. So we learned two terms now. One of them is called model parameter, which are the weights and the bias values connecting these neurons to each other and something else that is called the hyperparameter, which is more related to the structure of my model. What's the number of neurons? What are the number of hidden layers? And what kind of activation function should I use? Should I use a sigmoidal activation function to give me the nonlinearity, or should I use a tench or, or softmax, whatever? And so you use the training data and feed this training data to your model. So you try to learn the weight and the bias values using the training data. And then there is another stage called the validation stage where you keep changing the structure of your model, the number of layers, number of neurons, type of activation functions you use, and see which combination would give you the best performance at the output. So this is what you would do with your data, the train data. You take the train data, split it in two parts, one to figure out the weight and the bias values, and another part to figure out the structure of your model. When your training is complete, with the validation, and you have now a final model with all weights known, all bias values known, the structure is known, then you use your test data to evaluate the performance of your model. Yeah, so the model parameters, we learn the weights and the bias values with like uh, gradient descent optimization, and we solve them with back propagation, but we're not going through that here. And the model hyperparameter, like the number of layers, neurons, activation functions, and so on, we learn this through a grid search. So basically, you try every possible combination. It's not every possible. You try, you try as many combinations as you can based on your computational power, and then you figure out what will be the best combination that give you the best performance. Yeah, this is for the network architecture. These are some options of the activation functions, which give you the nonlinearity in your model. It can be sigmoid, it can be a tench function. The most famous one now is Relu. Relu gives very good results for the activation function. We have Liku, leaky Relu, and exponential Relu. And for the output function, we usually use something like softmax or uh, sometimes also use sigmoid. Okay. Uh, there is also uh, another hyperparameter, which is called the dropout. So you don't have to connect to all neurons to each other. No, maybe you drop the connection between some of the neurons. This is similar in people when we forget, right? Like when I forgot something. This was not processed and passed to the next neuron. Why this is useful? Because you want your model to be able to generalize well. You want your model to learn from the data rather than memorizing the data. So you'd make it forget some values and then see if it will do better with this. Uh, forgetting the data. So this is called the dropout. And what's the fraction of the neurons that will not be connected to each other? We call it D, the dropout value. Okay, so that's for the feedforward neural network. We have input layer, bunch of hidden layers, and an output layer. The number of neurons in the input layer is related to the number of features. Number of neurons in the output layer related to the number of classes that you would have. The number of neurons in the hidden layers are your choice. The number of layers in the hidden layer are your choice. Uh, you try from the training data to learn the weight and bias values. You try, with, you try with the validation data to learn the structure of your model. Number of neurons in the hidden layer, number of layers, which will indicate the depth of your model. Uh, activation functions, drop out. You try to learn all of this from the validation. When your model is trained and complete, then you go to the... Uh, testing stage where you give it the example 
and you record what is the predicted class. You take the predicted class and the actual class, because you know what it is, it's your data set, and compare them and come up with the confusion matrix. From the confusion matrix, you can calculate any metric, detection rate, false alarm, accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, whatever you want. Okay? Any, any question about this? So what I want to show you now is, is a code. for this training and, and testing. Yeah, I have it here, actually. So, so these codes are in, in Google Colab. If you have a Gmail account, you can actually train and test machine learning models on your browser, right? I was teaching the, the, the machine learning class the first time it was four or five years ago, and we were using Anaconda, and most of the time we are spending our effort just to fix the clash between the libraries. Most of the time we're just doing that, right? Just, just figuring out all these clashes. Here, it's the most, like the cleanest thing I have ever seen. All you need to focus on is just your code and the results. That's it. You don't have to worry about anything else. You import libraries, you then work with your data, write your code, get the results. Google Colab. If you have a Gmail account, you can just use it. And the other amazing thing is now you can train machine learning models, which are actually computationally intensive, with your mobile phone. My mobile phone is always lame. It's always like old and very poor computational power, but I can type the code of my model and then pass it to the cloud. It will train the model and I see the results on my phone, right? So again, I don't need computational power. This is awesome, right? So how, how the code is structured? It is structured like this. You'd always find that these codes that I, I shared with you on the slides, if you click on the data set, you'd find the data set. If you click on the code, you would find the code uh, for all the, the models, even the ones that will not be able to cover due to time. You can check them. All the codes are structured like this. The first part, I import the libraries. So with deep models, we need a Keras library. The codes here are based on Python. So all these are Python scripts. It's, it's very famous and, and very common to use Python. There are so many groups and libraries, and you can find lots of resources. That's why we use Python. So for deep models, you need Keras libraries and you need some other supporting libraries. So the first part of my code, I import the libraries. Then I import the data, right? The data set, my data set, and then I process them. And when I say I process them, I split them into train and test. I do the normalization we talked about. And now my data is ready to use. Then I do the model training. This is where I try to learn what are the parameters, like the weight and bias, and the hyperparameters, as in the structure of my model. And then I do after the training is complete, the testing of my model. So I make, I use the model to predict the class. I take the predicted class and the actual class, compare them and come up with the confusion matrix. Uh, and now I can see the performance of my model. Now, one interesting thing is that these codes that I'm sharing with you today, we generated them with ChatGPT. Okay, you don't have to start the code from scratch you can actually have a prototype from ChatGPT, and then you need to fix it and refine it until it is your final desirable product. In order to do that, so this is what we did to generate these codes with ChatGPT. The first one is that we did a, a prompt to develop the code for a model. Like for example, I say, I want you to act as a data scientist. So this is the tone because you need to get the experience of a data scientist. Programming in Python, I specify the programming language that I want my code to be in. And then I say, write a code to train and test, let's say, for example, a support vector machine that, and I give as many details as I can, right? What's my problem is about? I want to classify these two, a data set classified uh, benign and malicious and whatever. I give all the information about my problem. Then they will give you a code, and this code is not necessarily what you want. Like, for example, with the autoencoder, it was not based on reconstruction error, something that is not what I want. Then I say, refine your model to fix this part, right? When this is done, I would customize the model for the model's code for my data set. Like I say, okay, now this is the model that I want. It looks like what I desire in all parts. Now I say, okay, now adjust this model to accept, for example, a data set consisting of four features, and these are time series data. 
then it will adjust the starting part and it will write the import data part for you. And then I would run. When you run, you will find so many errors, right? It will be unnormal if you find it working. That will be, then I haven't used ChatGPT 4. This is ChatGPT 3.5, but it would be amazing if it run without error. So you need to fix now these errors. If you ask ChatGPT to fix the errors for you, it will make it worse. At least again, ChatGPT 3.5 that I, I was using. For me to fix the errors, I used Google, right? I Google and then this is, because also ChatGPT is trained with data until 2021. Uh, so some libraries uh, are no longer used, expired, whatever. Then when I Google, I find the solution for this problem, right? So I do Google search to fix these errors. So this is what we did in order to generate the codes that I'm sharing with you uh, today. So going back to, to the code, this is now the code for the feedforward neural network. And so I'm acknowledging here that this code was generated with ChatGPT and my collaborator, Abdurrahman and I, we worked together to fix these errors. So the first part, following the, the flow chart that I showed you here, this flow chart, I'm importing libraries, loading and processing data, training the model, and then testing and evaluating my model. So this is step one where I import all the libraries I'm going to need. You would always need NumPy because you're doing some math, so you would need NumPy. You would need Panda because this is to work on your data, right? And then you would need TensorFlow, like Keras models. This is where we get the a feed forward neural network library. So I'm importing the sequential function for the feed forward model. I import a dense layer. Uh, also, I import a function for train and test from sklearn, right? So sklearn is another library that can give you functionalities that you would need. This is where I will split my data into train and test. This is when I do the grid search for the hyperparameter optimization. Uh, and this is also with, with sklearn where I get the confusion matrix and I can calculate the accuracy of my model, the precision, the recall, and so on. So what you need to do, I forgot to mention that, is you need to upload your data, right? So where do we upload the data? We do it here. Here, right? So you click on this folder icon here and you need to import your data here. And the data that I'm sharing with you, it looks like this. So it's a tabular data. This would give you a power value every 30 minutes. So because the day is 24 hours, so I'm giving you 48 uh, power value. And then the last one, the last column, would tell you if it is one or zero, benign or malicious. What we did here is we just manipulated the value of the reading. Like let's say it is actually 10 watt and we change it to be eight watt. Right, so this is malicious. This is false data being injected, and it is not the true value, okay? So here, this example is a simple example with a single feature. I only have power measurement value, and I have two classes. Either it is the actual power measurement value from the system, or it is false data injection attack, where we changed the value from the system to be something else displayed on the HMI screen, okay? So these are the two classes. One is the malicious, like as you can see here. So this is class one. And this is, for example, class zero, which means it's benign. So this whole example, the value is not changed. So this is your data set. What you need to do is to get this data set. You can save it as CSV and then upload it here in this location. Now you can run your file. It will import the data and work on it. So as I said, in step number one, we imported the libraries. Then in step number two, we would load and the process our data. So here, I'm just reading the data from my Excel sheet. Uh, this is the Panda uh, read function. And then I am uh, splitting my data into feature and the label, right? Uh, this is just for uh, processing my data. So X here are all my features. I know that these are the first 48 columns, right? Because I said I have a sample every 30 minutes. So I know I have 48 uh, sample for the whole day. And Y is the last column. This is my label. Is it benign or malicious, zero or one? And then I'll take my features and labels, and I'll split them into train and test. 
uh, there is a function here called the train and test split. And I'm just using my tests to be 20% of the data. So I take my entire data and take 80% of this data to train my model and 20% of the data to test the model. These are like usually we do 70, 30 or 80, 20. These are usual splits that we do. Then after this is done, I imported the libraries, I imported the data. Now I will train the model and optimize the hyperparameters. So what I do here, because I want to keep changing the structure of my model for the hyperparameter optimization, right? In the, in the hyperparameter optimization, I'm changing the number of layers, I'm changing the number of neurons, I'm changing the activation functions, and I'm trying different combinations to tune my model. So to do that, I, I define a function for how my model would look like. And this function would take these Argument, th these arguments here, like what is the number of layer, what are the number of neurons, what are the activation functions I'm using, and what kind of optimizer, because I told you that the training is based on solving a gradient descent problem, and there are different optimizers that can solve this problem. Different optimizers give you sometimes better results than others. I define uh, my model to be a sequential, so feedforward neural network are sequential models, so this is a sequential model. And then I keep adding layers. So I say, this is my first layer, the input layer. I say model.add. So I'm adding the first layer. Uh, the name of the layer here is called dense. So this is a dense layer. So in feed forward, again, the layer is called the dense layer. And it takes what are the number of neurons. And the number of neurons here are given, are given from the uh, dimension of the input features. Okay, so to, for the first layer, this is just the dimension uh, it is the number of neurons is given by the dimension of the input features. Now, after the input layer, I'm going to add as many hidden layers as I want. So I'll just create a for loop, and this for loop depends on the number of layers that the user would give me. Depending on this for loop, I keep adding dense layers. The number of neurons are specified by the user. The kind of activation function are also specified by the user. And these are all the hidden layers. So everything inside the for loop are my hidden layer. This line here at the end is just my output layer. So I just have my output layer uh, with a sigmoid activation. You can also change this to be a hyperparameter. Okay. So this is here now my structure. It's a sequential model. This is the input layer. The for loop is how many hidden layers I have. And then this is my output layer. And after I define my whole thing, I do a compilation, right? So I compile my model, so model.compile. You need to specify what is your loss because this is an optimization problem that you're trying to solve. So what is you're trying to optimize? What is the objective function of your optimization here? And it is binary cross entropy. Whenever you are doing a classification problem with two classes, the objective function is called binary cross entropy, right? By optimizing this, you try to make the predicted class the same as the actual class. So this objective function will give you that. It try to make the prediction and the actual match. And because this is an optimization problem, you specify the optimizer that will help you to solve it. And what is the metric that you are trying to improve here? In this case, we are trying to improve accuracy. You can improve anything else, F1 score, whatever. And return model. So this is where we defined our model, okay? Now this model, it needs these values, right? The number of layers, the number of neurons, the activation function, and the optimizer. So we create something called the dictionary, which are all possible uh, search space, right? So for example, for the number of layers, I'm trying two values, two and three. So I can have either two hidden layers or three hidden layers. For the number of neurons, I can have 32 neuron in the hidden layer or 46, uh, sorry, 64. For the activation function, you can have as many as you want. I only tried Relu. For the optimizer, you can try as many as you want. I only tried ADM. So this is my search space for the hyperparameter optimization. Then I say that my model, this thing here, Keras classifier, to build the model based on this function, right? the function that I created. And then I do a, a random search, which means I'm just asking to try all possible combinations of these hyperparameters. So for example, it will first try two hidden layers with 32 neurons. Then it will try two hidden layers with 64 neurons with just some random combinations. This is how I try to figure out the structure of my model. Okay. And then I call the fit function, right? So I say fit. Fit means here now, given this search space and given the definition of my model, solve this optimization problem using the data set. So that's why you can see inside the fit, inside the, the model.fit, I pass my data the train features, and the train labels. Okay, so I give it the data. So using this data, 
we will try to learn what should be the weight and the bias values. And also we will do the hyperparameter optimization to figure out the structure of the model. Now what you need to do is you, you come here, up here, and then you say model run. Uh, where run time, and then you say run all. Okay, so in the run time, if you hit run all, it will run your model. Now it's doing the optimization for the model parameters and also the hyperparameters. And, and this is how it evolved over time, right? This is the training of my model. And now the training of my model is complete. When the train is complete, now I want to predict for the test features what would be the predicted label. Okay, and remember I said this is a likelihood, right? It will tell me the likelihood that I am malicious. So I would say if the likelihood is greater than 50%, if there is a 50, more than 50% chance that this is malicious, then label it as malicious, okay? So this is my predicted label. Then I take the actual label because this is my data set. I know what's the label and the predicted label by the model and create my confusion matrix using this function. And now I can use the accuracy score function to compare these two and calculate the accuracy. I can also calculate the precision, recall, and F1 score. And it will print the values for you here. Now, the accuracy of my model is 88%. You can do much better than that. I'll give you, uh, at the end of the slide, some of our published papers. You can do much better, but you would need to spend time on the hyperparameter optimization, like the tuning. You might need to use more data and so on. One thing that I would like also to mention about Google Colab is that you can use GPU. Right, so I think in the edit, let me see if I remember. So in the edit, there is something for the setting. Hmm. Tools, settings, which one? In, under the runtime, okay. This one? Yeah, and then you can choose uh, CPU, you can use GPU or you can use even TPU, okay? So it can give you uh, better computational power. Okay, and, and this is how the, the code look like. And you would find that every code that I write is always structured like this. I import libraries, I import the data, pre-process the data, define a function for the model so I can use it later on for hyperparameter optimization, and then do the fit function to train my model. When this is done, I do the testing and evaluation, okay? Any, any question about this? Good. Okay, now, as I said, due, due to time, I don't think we can cover all the supervised models, but the other models are like the recurrent neural network. Now, this one would capture the correlation or temporal dependencies between the samples because the value here depend on the value at the previous time step and the value here depend on the values at the previous two time steps and so on, right? So there is some temporal dependencies. You want to capture these temporal dependencies while training your model. Feed forward will not do that because it's just passing the data forward. You want something that is able to capture the temporal dependencies with a feedback loop like this. What's the dependencies between the current sample and the previous sample? So you need a feedback like this. This is called the recurrent neural network. Now, recurrent neural networks, the problem with them, like in their basic form, which is called the vanilla recurrent neural network, there is something called the vanishing gradient and explosive gradient. It simply means that your model will not be able to learn long-term dependencies. Like, let's say the data I shared with you has 48 samples. If you try to learn the dependency between the data at time t equal 48 and the data at time t equal 1, this is a very long dependencies and the model will not be able to learn that. So this basic model, which is the vanilla recurrent neural network, will not help you to learn long-term dependencies. Something that is better version or a variant is called LSTM model, long short-term memory unit. Okay, This uses a bunch of gates so that it can learn a long-term memory and a short-term memory and fuse them to give better detection performance. <coughs> And now your, your final model, again, it has a bunch of LSTM units, and you can repeat them over multiple hidden layers that tell the, the depth of your model. Uh, and this is how the, the deep recurrent neural network look like. Again, you can click on these uh, links to find the data set and to find the code, and the code is structured as before. The other one is the CNN, the convolutional neural network. So this try to learn a pattern in the data. 
as I said before, it's used mainly for like image recognition. Uh, if you want to learn if this is letter O or letter X, there is a repetitive pattern in letter O. It's it's these three blocks, right? They're always black. This three blocks and these, the same three blocks, but in the other direction, another three blocks, another three blocks, and then you say that this is letter O. If you have this pattern, this is letter O. Letter X, it has this, this kind of pattern, right? So again, you try to, to learn the pattern inside your data with CNN. How you do that? You do that with filters, okay? So you use filters and you apply something called convolution in order to learn the pattern. And after you learn the pattern, you try to see if your data has this pattern or not. So for example, the benign data, they have a pattern that look differently from the malicious data. You learn uh, this pattern, and now you can differentiate between the two classes. And as I said, the, the, this is mainly was done for image recognition, but it's just, what's an image? It's an array of, of pixels. You can rearrange your data, although it's time series data, to be an array of pixels, right? And, and then you can again apply CNN. And here I also give like a data set and sample code for the CNN model. Now, as I said, this is our physical system, which is uh, power nodes connected together with some transmission lines. And this is actually a graph. So our data is not just a 2D data, which is a value over time. No, it's also a graph structured data because the values at one node, they are related to the values at the connected node, right? There are some laws like power flow laws following Kirchhoff voltage law and Kirchhoff current law that when they are applied, these adjacent nodes affect each other, right? So our data is not just time series data 2D, it's also graph structured data. With graph structured data, the best model to use here is graph neural network. And there are different versions of graph neural network like graph convolutional or graph recurrent. Uh, the point is, our power system is best model as a graph and our data is graph structured data. And the edges connecting these nodes with each other are described by the adjacency matrix. It will give you the connectivity of these nodes. And what we are labeling here is the graph. So we are saying that this graph is under attack or this graph is not under attack. So is it benign or malicious setup? This is similar to the concept of convolution with something called message passing. But this is how we train these, these models with, with graph convolutions. Now the code, I didn't find the time to write the code, but now you are so good, you can do it yourself with ChatGPT and then refine the model. And it will be a challenging kind of task, but it should work well. So everything we covered so far was supervised learning. Any question about the supervised learning models? Yes. So with the the graph models, you said it was able to capture time dependency or time related um, tendencies as well as like the connections, right? So is that just through you're feeding it a series of these graphs? at different timestamps, and that's how it's... Yes, so the first thing is that these are called graph convolutional neural networks. So there is a convolutional operator that will learn the temporal correlation between the data. And yes, I passed it to them at different time steps. But this graph, the edges, like the adjacency matrix, is not changing over the time step, right? So, so here, the only thing that's changing over the time step is the node values, like what's the volt at each node, what's the power, what's the current, all these kind of things, right? Uh, and the special is learned because of the adjacency matrix, right? So this is the one uh, down there. This one here is the, the function that we try to learn. And as you can see, the function that we try to learn, it has A, which uses the adjacency matrix. That's the special connectivity between the nodes. It uses the feature value. So it's already a time series feature. And we use convolution operator to learn the correlation between them. And W here is the weight of importance for these features. This is the parameter we try to learn. These are the weight values. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other question? Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. So we'll take five minutes break and then we will uh, conclude with uh, unsupervised models. And then I'll tell you why cyber physical fusion would improve your detection performance. Yeah. Five minutes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So.
uh, this is the almost the, the last part. We have two parts to discuss the unsupervised learning, like how we can train an unsupervised model to detect these attacks. And then uh, when we do cyber physical fusion, so, so how much of improvement we would get in performance. So for the unsupervised model, again, we have different versions of these models. The simplest one is the autoencoder, but then we can have a recurrent autoencoder and we can have a graph autoencoder. Due to time, I'll only discuss the, the, the simple autoencoder, but you have also codes for the recurrent one. <clears throat> so what is an autoencoder? The, the autoencoder is a feedforward neural network that is a special form of a feedforward neural network that is trained in an unsupervised manner. Uh, what it basically do, it has two stages. One of them is called an encoder, which compresses the data. And then another one, which is called a decoder, which decompress the data. So what we are trying to do here is to compress the data and then decompress it, trying to restructure the same data. OK, so I'm trying to restructure the same data. Now, the training here is done only with the features. So I don't have any labels telling that this is benign or malicious because I will only use the benign data to train the model. So the training of this model is done only with benign data. And I'll teach this model how to compress the data and then decompress it optimally to recover the same data. And by optimally, I mean in a way that minimizes the reconstruction error. Because whenever you compress the data and decompress it, there will always be something called a reconstruction error. Because I train this model only with benign data, the model will learn to minimize the reconstruction error only for benign data. So whenever now you are testing the model after it's completely trained and you pass to it benign data, you would find the reconstruction error minimal. But if you pass to it anything that is not normal, like malicious data, and it compress it and decompress it, the reconstruction error will be large. Again, why? Because the model was trained only to reconstruct benign data. Okay, so this difference between the reconstruction error is what will indicate if this is benign or malicious. So after I train this model and I calculate the reconstruction error, if it is below a threshold, then this is normal data. If it is above some threshold, it is a malicious data. This is how the, the, the model look like. Again, it looks similar to the feedforward neural network because I have an input layer and I have a bunch of hidden layers and I have an output layer and all these layers have neurons and they are all connected. But the difference is this model consists of two parts. One of them is called an encoder where we reduce the number of neurons at each hidden layer of the encoder port. So for example, if this is an image 28 by 28, then the number of neurons here are equal to 784 neuron because each neuron would represent one pixel in the image. This is my input layer. The first hidden layer will have 300 neurons. So as you can see, I am decreasing the number of neurons from 700 to 300. Then the next hidden layer will be 150. So again, I'm decreasing the number of neurons. And then I reach an, uh, a layer that's called the bottleneck. So this is the last layer here in the encoder, it's 50 neurons. So as you can see, I'm compressing the data, right? It was 700 neurons, then 300, then 150, then 50. So this is the encoder part which compresses the data. Then we have a decoder part which will do the decompression. And it is the exact mirror of the encoding. So for example, this was 150 neurons, then this first layer in the decoder will be 150. So it's the exact mirror around the bottleneck, right? So around this bottleneck, we do the exact mirror, 150, 150. Then this is 300, again it's 300. Then the output is the same as the input size, 784. Okay, what we will do, as you can see here, this is the actual, like the input image, and then we compress it, and then we decompress it, and this is now the decompression. It is very close to the compressed version. Maybe it's a little bit hazy, but this is the reconstruction error. And here, because this model is well-trained, it reconstructed the same digit four, but with some sort of, a small error. What we will do, as I said before, is to train this model with normal data. So it will learn how to compress it and decompress it with minimal error. Then, after it, the training is complete, I will pass to it normal and malicious data. For any normal data, the reconstruction error will be minimal because this is what the model has been trained on. For any malicious data, the reconstruction error will be large because the model was not trained on malicious data. And the threshold between the 
two reconstruction errors is what will tell us if this is normal data, benign data, or malicious data. So this is an abstraction of how the, the autoencoder look like. We call the, 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 the feature after compression at the bottleneck the latent space. And as I said, the, the number of input neurons is the same as the output neurons because I'm trying to reconstruct the same data. The decoder is the exact mirror of the encoder. Uh, but what you can control is how many uh, hidden layers in the encoder. And so you can repeat them in the decoder. And how many neurons you should include in a decreasing order for the encoder point, right? What, what kind of hyperparameters you would have? As I said, the number of hidden layers in the encoder, and then you repeat them in the decoder. The number of neurons per the hidden layer, but always make sure it is decreasing in the encoder, and it is the same mirror, but increasing in the decoder. And what kind of activation functions? Because again, you can use ReLU or, or Tench or whatever. And we do this with, with grid search. Now, what you will do to evaluate this model is that you will, you will pass to it the, the data. It will do the reconstruction. So this is the, the reconstruction after it is done. Then you, you check the uh, reconstruction error. And based on the reconstruction error, if it is above than 50%, you, you say, or if it is above, sorry, then a threshold to 50%. A threshold, you say that this is malicious. If it is below, you say it is benign. And then you come up with the label, right? After you have the predicted label based on this threshold criteria, you compare it with the actual label. And now you have the confusion matrix from which you can calculate anything you want. How would you learn the threshold that differentiate between a benign reconstruction error and the malicious reconstruction error? You learn this threshold through the validation data. So you try different thresholds and see which one would give you the correct answer, right? Because if the threshold is too low, maybe the data is benign, but you just said it is malicious. So you get so many false alarm. If the threshold is too high, maybe there are some attacks that you are unable to detect. So you want to find, uh, I would say, a good threshold that balance your detection rate and false alarm. And this is something that you do through validation. You try different threshold levels until you figure out the best one. So in, in our code, again, if you go to the link that I provided in the slide, Again, as before, we import all the libraries that we would need, uh, including the, the TensorFlow, the, the TensorFlow Keras libraries, the SK libraries for train and test split, grid search, confusion matrices, and some parameters, uh, the NumPy and the Pandas, Pandas to process the data, NumPy to do some mathematical operations whenever needed. So this is the first part, we import the data. Then we load and process our data. Again, you would put your data in this part. And if you now see the data, that I'm sharing here, you'd find that the train data is only benign. So you can see now I have two different data sets. One of them is called the train, and one of them is called test, and you need to upload both. Why? Because the train data now is only benign, and the test data has benign and malicious, right? So whenever I'm training my model, I train it only with benign data to learn the reconstruction error and try to minimize it in the benign data. But when I test, I use different data, benign and malicious, so I can evaluate how good my model is. I'll load my data, ext, and then uh, I will include uh, what's the label, because the label depends. I know the label, right? I need the label to evaluate the model, not to train the model. So here I need the label so I can evaluate the model, not to train it. Train it only with benign. Uh, and then I do this loading for the train data and for the test data. I load the feature, the label, the feature, the label. I use only the feature exit train to train the model, but then I will use in the test data the features and the labels in order to evaluate my model. To train this model, again, we will create the function, right? It will take as an input the number of layers, the number of neurons, the activation function. These are my hyperparameters. I start with my input shape, right? Because the input layer has the same number of neurons as the input uh, features. And then I create encoder and decoder layers as like empty arrays because I will add them one by one. And whatever I will add in the encoder, I will add the mirror of it in the decoder, right? 
and when when this is complete i will again uh, do the compile right so this is the compile function here uh, the loss of this model is not binary cross entropy it's mean square error because it tried to calculate the reconstruction error right so the reconstruction error is the mean square error it's the difference between the input and the output you take the input and the output subtract them find the mean over all sample and square this is the mean square error this is your reconstruction error so whenever you are training this model your loss function is the mean square error uh, and then we use uh, the adm optimizer to train this model I need again for my search space for the hyperparameters to identify what are the number of layers that I'm going to try, number of neurons I'm going to try, different types of activation functions, because then I will do a grid search over all these parameters, right? So I will use my model and I'll do grid search over the structure of my model. And then I here say fit, right? So now I am doing the training of this model. As you can see in the fit function, I only use the features. So this is exit train, exit train. This is my input is the train data and the output is the reconstruction of this train data. I'm not having labels. If you remember in the feed forward neural network example, when we say uh, model.fit, we used exit train and y train, the labels. So we use the feature and the label. But here, this is unsupervised. I'm only using the feature of the train data. I'm not using the label. Then I will run the, the, the training of the model. It will keep training. And when the training is complete, I do now the testing. In the testing, I say model.predict, because now I'm trying to use my test feature to predict the output. And then here, I'm just calculating the mean square error of my prediction, because I'm trying to reconstruct the same input, and I want to calculate the reconstruction error. Then I will compare the reconstruction error with the threshold. If it is higher, I'd say it is malicious. If it is lower, I'll say it is benign. In this example, I did not uh, do a grid search over the threshold, but you can do that. You can keep trying different thresholds until you find the best. And then I calculate the confusion matrix, the accuracy, and everything. Uh, this model, it has an accuracy of 73%. But again, I, I have, I'll, I'll show you some papers of, of my work where, no, you can achieve more than 90%. Why here it gives this? Because I didn't use my entire data set, it was taking lots of time to run. But you, you can throw it on the cluster and just keep it running until it used the entire data and do a good job. This is number one. Number two, I didn't do a very exhaustive grid search. Like the tuning of the model is very important. You can try different number of layers, different number of activation functions. Um, you can do hyperparameter over the threshold. I didn't do any of that because of time. But you can do that and it will give you very good performance, actually. As I said, like it's very high, like 95, 98. It can give you very good result. OK? Any any question about the autoencoder, the, the unsupervised learning? Now, similar to the uh, feed-forward autoencoder, you can have a recurrent autoencoder. So now the, the units here are not just neurons, they are LSTM units, right? These are LSTM units, and the, again, it has the kind of encoder-decoder structure. So you are taking the input data, you are compressing them with LSTM units, and then decompressing them with a mirror of LSTM units until you reconstruct the same input, okay? But now your units are not just simple neurons, but no, they are LSTM units that can capture the temporal dependencies in the data. This is called LSTM autoencoder. And again, there is a sample code and some data set. You can see how it works. You can do the same with the graph. So now, again, you can have a graph autoencoder. So the number of graphs keeping decreasing, right? The graph convolutional operator. Here it's three, two, one until you reach the bottleneck. Then you expand. And this is, again, a graph autoencoder concept. So, so these are the models. We, we took the time to discuss roughly how these models work, but the codes, we went through the feed-forward neural network and the feed-forward autoencoder codes. You have codes for everything except for the graph, but this is a good starting point. And as I said, you can use the existing platforms like ChatGPT or whatever to help you to create the codes for whatever you need.
Now, the last part is when we said there is cyber physical fusion. Everything I showed you now, it was using only the, the physical features like power values, right? And I manipulated the reading and the power value and I tried to learn the differences with my classifiers. But in our work, what we did is no, we not only used the power values, voltage values, current values, and so on. We also used the header information, like the IP addresses of the source and destination, port numbers, MAC addresses, packet size, all this information. And then we, we fused all these features in our models. Okay, so our model, the results I'll show you now, we have these different types of models. One of them is called the cyber only model. So this is trained using only this header information, right? Whenever you're launching an attack from another node, the IP address will change, the, the, the port number, whatever you're doing, something will change the size of the packet. So we are using only these features in order to detect the attack. We have another set of models, which are physical only models that will use only the payload value, which is the power measurement value, current value, voltage value to detect if there is an attack. And then we have other models, which we call them cyber physical models. So here the features are both from the cyber space and the physical space, and we include all of them to find what's the detection performance. And our performance metrics are the detection rate. So uh, out of all these attacks, which one was really detected? And the false alarm, how many of the ones that the model said they were attack were not an attack? This is a false alarm. So these are our metrics that we considered. Um, here, I'm showing the results for the ransomware attack and the false data injection attack for the different models. Uh, feed forward is the, or FNN is the feed forward neural network. This is a supervised model. RNN is the LSTM recurrent neural network, our supervised model. Uh, AEA is the uh, autoencoder with attention. It's, it's a recurrent unit with an attention layer. And GNN is our graph neural network supervised model. One thing P here is the physical only features, models trained only with physical features, C models trained only with cyber features, and CP is trained with cyber and the physical features. One thing that you can observe is as the model complexity increase, as the detection performance improve. So this is the detection rate DR, and this is the false alarm FE. The feed forward neural network did a detection rate of 70%. When you capture the temporal dependencies, this grows to 79. When you include also unsupervised model with an attention layer, it gives you 85%. And when you exploit the special correlation of the data, it improved to 88%, okay? This is using only the physical features. When you use only the cyber features, you can also do similar kind of trend, uh, depending on the complexity of the model that you are using. But when you fuse both the cyber feature and the physical feature, you see a performance improvement in the models. Why? Because you feed your model now information that portray or capture the both the cyber space and the physical space. This is now a complete picture of your system. Your system is not only physical, it's not only cyber, it's both cyber and physical. And to draw a picture of the whole system, you need information from both domains, okay? So with the cyber physical model, we are feeding the model with the machine learning model with all this information, how the cyber layer look like, how the physical layer look like, the reading, the measurement, the data, and now it use all this knowledge in order to give a detection performance. So you can see that there is a consistent improvement in the model uh, whenever you do cyber physical fusion. Uh, it improves both the detection rate and the false alarm. So it increases your detection rate and decreases your false alarm. So roughly we have from five to 13% improvement in detection rate when you use GNN. So when you capture spatial and temporal all together, this improve your detection performance. And the false alarm also reduces by six to 13%. When you do cyber physical fusion, and this is, we call it a machine learning multimodal because you use feature from different uh, modality, right? It, it's a cyber and physical different domains, but also you have multiple features. We call it multimodal. Uh, so there is roughly 7% improvement in detection rate and 3% reduction in false alarm. Again, why this behavior, uh, we got it? Because you now give your model features that describe both cyber and physical layers. So this is what, what we covered in our uh, workshop. We first discussed in general, what is a cyber physical system, cyber layer and physical layer. And in the cyber layer, you're doing the sensing, the computation, and then the control, and there are networking to connect all these components together. The physical layer is your process or, or system, whether a power system or something else. Then we have seen a test bed for a power system as a cyber physical. The physical component was done uh, on MATLAB Simulink with Opal RT. 
open RT will enable you if you want in the future to do hardware in the loop to include hardware devices like a PLC or, or whatever. And now when you attack, you're not only doing these attacks on the virtual machines, but you can attack your actual hardware. It's part of your physical system. Uh, and then the physical, the cyber layer, it was like Docker containers uh, hosted on the cyber range. Uh, and then we did the coupling between the cyber and the physical layers. Now we have our cyber physical power system. We used this system to collect benign data, normal operation of the power system with uh, load profile over six months because you need lots of data to train your model. So we did six months load profile to give different scenarios and then train our, uh, collect our data. Then we launched some attacks for the same system under same load profile. Now our attacks were full data injection, uh, brute force attack, uh, backdoor, ransomware. You can do whatever you want. And in our uh, attack model, we try to open or close the switches, right? So this is what we try to control. You can also control other things. Maybe you there is something called stealthy full data injection attack where you give different value of, you change the measurement value. So the actual power value is P, you change it to P dash and send it to the, operator on the HMI. This will give false state of the system, not the actual correct state. So there are different attacks that you can try. Um, yeah. Now that we collected the data, we can develop deep learning models for intrusion detection. Uh, we, we discussed roughly that you always need to import your data, split it into train and test. Train would give you the model parameters. In neural networks, these are the weight and the bias values of the model. Um, and also you can do hyperparameter optimization, the structure of your model and activation functions and so on. And then finally, you test your model to evaluate its performance. The train and test data must be completely different, okay? Then we have seen there are two different ways to train these models, either supervised, where we use the feature and the label of the feature while training the model, okay? So I give it the example and I tell it that this is benign. I give it the example and tell it this is malicious. It will learn and then give the, uh, detection performance for unseen data, which is the test data. The deep unsupervised, you only use the benign data and you try to capture some pattern inside the data. In this case, it was how to minimize like what is the minimum reconstruction error, right? In my data with the autoencoder structure. Uh, then we have seen, so, so this is a type when I say deep unsupervised model in the last bullet, no, it's just a deep model based on multimodal uh, cyber physical fusion. And we have seen that when you fuse data collected from the cyber layer, the physical layer, you plot the whole picture of the system, which is a cyber physical system. And now the model can learn better, which will give you better detection performance. It will reduce the false alarm and improve the detection rate. So out of these models, the one that give excellent result was the graph neural network and graph autoencoders in our research in power system. Why? Because I can model my system as a graph and then learn from the spatial relationship and also the temporal relationship in my data. So these are some uh, recommended publication, some, some readings based on the work that we have done. These are all based on physical data. The paper that has the cyber physical, it's accepted in the IEEE Smart Grid Com. So maybe if you visit my Google Scholar recently, we give them some time, you can find this paper that describe our test bed, that describe uh, how we train the models, the cyber physical fusion and give the results. Yeah, uh, I want, th these are also excellent reading material. Uh, Andrew Ng at, at Stanford. So, so this is, uh, he, he has on YouTube and also I think on uh, Coursera, excellent course, Introduction to Machine Learning. If you're not familiar with machine learning, this is an amazing course. This is, I didn't study machine learning at school. I studied it from this course. Okay, and now all my research and teaching, everything is based on machine learning. This is a very nice introduction to machine learning. And I think he has another course on YouTube on deep learning. I, I haven't checked that one, but I think there is one like that. Now, the second link, Josh Starmer, he has a very nice YouTube channel. I think it's called StatQuest. He explained to you the machine learning models with, with graphics, right? So you would see the, the hyperplane and how it keep changing as you change the model parameters. It's a very nice graphical way to understand these concepts. These concepts are very mathematically intensive and can be very difficult to capture and understand. But with this graphical view, you find the concept <laughs> trivial and very easily explained. He's really good in doing that. And then the last one, Alex Fu, is where I got some information about the graph neural network. It's also a graphical kind of thing. And it will explain to you how to do that. And as I said, the first couple of slides, I think the first five to 
nine slides. These are based on the course of Dr. Tommy Maurice at University of Alabama Huntsville on cyber physical systems. The first five or 10 slides where I introduced you what's a cyber physical system, what are the components of a SCADA system. Okay. Yeah. And that's all for my workshop. If you have any question, I'll be happy to, to take them. Thank you. So I'm kind of curious on where you see the, you know, future work for, you know, deep learning and IDS. Do you see like, has work been done to maybe instead of just like a binary classification on like whether or not an attack is happening or not, like identifying what kind of attack happened? Because I mean, every uh, one kind of attack is going to facilitate one kind of response. Another kind of attack is going to facilitate something else. Yes, this is this is a very uh, interesting extension. To, to this concept, because as you can see, also we have uh, different attacks. So instead of developing our classifier, just tell you an attack happened, right? But you can also know and train model to give you also uh, multiple classes, right? Which will tell you the attack type. So the answer is yes, you can definitely do that. And this might uh, inform you with different prevention measure, right? Because this attack might require a specific action other than other attack. So so this is definitely a very good extension. As also you can you can see. In, in many of, not many, in some of the papers that I shared with you in these couple of slides, you can actually attack these machine learning models. There is an evasion attack, there is a data poisoning attack, and all these kind of attacks. So how also to develop robust machine learning models to withstand these kind of attacks on the model itself is also a very interesting uh, direction. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You.